Welcome to the Sunday special on Top Mid Talk. It's a potpourri of our favourite longer pieces, ideal for downloading and enjoying when you have a little bit more time. Top Mid Talk. I'm Joff Lacing. I'm joined by editor in chief of Top Mid Talk, uh, Monty Maiden. Um, and we're also joined by two very special guests to uh, discuss something that's often very close to the hearts of many anaesthetists um, and something that forms the bedrock of our very valued skill set, and that is laryngoscopy but specifically looking at the advent of video laryngoscopy and its current role in our clinical practice and where it may go in the future. And I should uh, caveat that the two guests here are actually going to be on opposing sides of a a debate in our afternoon session, so I'll try and keep the fight clean. Um, So our guests are uh, Tim Cook, Professor of Anesthesia and Intensive Care at Royal United Hospital in Bath, Director of the NAP Projects and Difficult Airway Society uh, Professor since 2014. Uh, and Dr. William Harrop Griffiths, Consultant Anaesthetist at St. Mary's Hospital uh, Imperial Healthcare. Uh, elected Member of the Council of the Royal College of Anaesthetists and past President of the AAGBI. Welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us. Hi there. Will, can I start with you then? So where do you stand? Should uh, video laryngoscopy be the standard of care and should we put uh, the standard direct uh, laryng- laryng- laryngoscope into the dusty cupboard. See, you know, it's easy for you I to say I nearly got that. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to debate later on today. It will be a fantastic debate. I think the result is, is kind of inevitable. I mean, let me just lay that out right from the start. That you'll win. But one of the problems with putting this within a debate context is that you make people take extreme views because the truth of the matter is not will video laryngoscopy take over and direct laryngoscopy never ever be used or video laryngoscopy is an appalling thing that we should never use and stick with direct laryngoscopy. The truth is in the middle. One of my main issues here is that we as anaesthetists love new bits of equipment. Yes. If they've got many buttons, we love them even any more. If they've got a video screen, we love them even more than that. The more high-tech the equipment, the more we love it. The more we adopt it very, very quickly, we embrace it, we run with it, we use it, and we go straight from that point of new technology to, I want to use it for everything. I'm just advising caution. I'm saying there is a role for video laryngoscopy. There will be a role for video laryngoscopy as part of our armamentarium for airway management but it is not the whole thing it's not the whole deal you can't ignore direct laryngoscopy um and and maybe maybe i'll bring tim in here but my understanding is that the weight of evidence goes in line with video laryngoscopy for optimal view and therefore you maybe say if you're going to get the best view of something maybe that should be your first line is that it's that, that's my view, and that's what we've been doing in my hospital in Bath, or the hospital I work in in Bath, uh, for the last five or six years. Uh, so we now have video laryngoscopy as our first line routine for intubation in intensive care, in anaesthesia, in the emergency department, and we're moving towards doing it also on the wards. So um, on, on an elective routine list with no oh, yes. evidence of difficult airway, this is a, oh, yes. your first... I also wear a seatbelt when I drive. I don't just put it on if I think I might crash. Um, nice and like so, video laryngoscopy is better. Um, I believe it's safer. Um, the perils of not getting intubation right first time are very significant. And as soon as you have one failed intubation, the risk of complications in- increase about sixfold. So, I don't think it's a device that really should be used as a rescue device. I think it should be used routinely. The other important factor is that. If you don't know what you're doing with a video laryngoscope, you gain no benefit from it. So uh, a meta-analysis we published about three years ago showed that uh, if you were inexperienced with a video laryngoscope, it provided no benefit. But if you're experienced with it, it it decreased failed intubations about threefold. And that's been reinforced by another systematic review since then. So getting it out when you're in trouble, using a device that you're not very familiar with, it's a bit daft, really, like trying to put your seatbelt on as you're sk- skidding across the motorway. But on that note, isn't that one of the problems of video laryngoscopy and the fact that I could go from trust to trust and, in- and encounter a totally different piece of technology each time? And therefore, my ability to become an expert it gets harder and harder. I think there are lots of challenges. I agree with that. Um, I think the next... So what is clear is that 
when we talk about a supermodic airway device, there are lots of different devices with different performance characteristics. They're not all the same. The same is true of video laryngoscopes. And it's my view that there's some rubbish on the market and there's some good kit on the market. Um, and probably the best device to use routinely is a device which you can use as a direct or video laryngoscopic device to start with. And then if you have difficulty, then convert to a, a hyperangulated blade. So um, there are two devices which that applies to. And so the device you have, you can use as a standard direct laryngoscopy yeah, as well. Yeah, so, so there, there, are, there are two companies who market devices which are um, Macintosh blade video laryngoscopes. The evidence is that using that device, you'll get a better view of the larynx and intubation will be easier. If you want to use direct laryngoscopy doing that, you can do. But video laryngoscopy is probably better. And it's certainly better for the other people in the room uh, to be able to see what's going on. Um, if you then have difficulty, and I mean even a little bit of difficulty, then you can then change to a hyperangulated blade, which will reduce your failed intubation significantly. I think the next stage we need to move on with research is we've established that video laryngoscopy improves intubation, reduces failed intubation, um, uh, and generally makes things safer, but we haven't established which are the best devices yet. So, Tim, I- I'm still agnostic on this, so I'm looking forward to the full debate. I find both sides compelling. I'm slightly in favour of your version of the argument since in our trust we had an event that uh, cost somebody their life and possibly the approach you're proposing that would not have happened. But but how do we keep the skill sets up? How do we get the balance of keeping the skill sets up? Because what Mm. happens when the video laryngoscope isn't available or doesn't work or the bits aren't there? How do we get get that? This is really interesting. Um, and it's, the, it's a very common question. Are we de-skilling? So there's, there's two aspects to it. First, are we de-skilling people? No, is the simple answer. There are three separate randomized controlled trials that show that if you train novices in direct laryngoscopy with a video laryngoscope, so the trainer can see what's going on, etc., etc., then you improve their direct laryngoscopy skills better okay. more than if you use a direct laryngoscope. And the second thing is, it's about the patient. It's not about the anaesthetist. If you choose a device that is a variation on the common blades as opposed to Correct. a very different device. And that's why I would advocate for routine use. You do do that. Mm. So if you're just using a, um, a video laryngoscope as a rescue device, then the logical mm. thing is you, is you pick a hyperangulated one mm. because you failed with direct laryngoscopy. But if you're going to embed it throughout your practice and use it for training, it makes sense to me to use something which is, as we call it, VL stroke DL with a hyperangulated blade as backup. Now, I'm going I'm to follow up on your comment, Monty, because mm. I think we saw with the laryngeal mask airway the introduction of a new technology and an associated skill set mm. that very, very quickly took over from the established technology and skin set, skill set, which was the old-fashioned mask and airway, mm. and we lost those skills to the detriment of ourselves, but more importantly to our patients. And I would not want to see us rush headlong into video laryngoscopy for fear that we will lose certain skill sets that only after they are lost we'll come back and say, oh dear, well, that happened because they weren't trained in direct laryngoscopy. Well, this is a recurring theme, I think, I, I feel, that this uh, welcoming advances in technology that may be at the detriment to a skill set but are better for patients. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's, Will's, Will's comment is not backed by any evidence at all. Uh, and I remember the, this, the same debate about uh, anaesthetists should not be allowed to use a laryngeal mask for the first six months or year or ten years of their training. Um, of no benefit to patients. But mask ventilation is intrinsically less good than a supercotic airway device, so let's do what's right for the patient. And I think video laryngoscopy, there's a, there's a very similar argument with that. I think one has to be careful about uh, what an academic's total reliance on published papers, and I think that we as clinicians with our feet firmly on the ground, have to look at our own widespread experience. Go and look at some of the younger anaesthetists now trying to maintain a basic mask and airway at the beginning of an anaesthetic. Watch the Goodell airway fly in within less than a second. Watch the three-handed or even four-handed airways that did not exist when people as old as my and myself were trainees. Watch the increased anxiety about maintaining an airway with a mask and airway. There is a loss. 
there may not be papers to say that there is a loss of a skill set, but we see it on a daily basis. There may be people blessed, like Professor Cook, with phenomenal skills across the range, but we are talking about providing people with a basic skill set that when all else fails, can rescue a patient. But is, is there any uh, level one anecdotal evidence if such a thing exists? Are there <laughs> legal cases? Are there claims bases? Are there, you know, shared anecdotes whereby the loss of that skill was the critical component of the patient being harmed? I, I, I see where you're coming from, Will. I'm with you. I, yeah. I was brought up that way. And the, and the ability to use one hand to, to provide a great airway in almost every patient. And ventilate that that was six was not full of cases of failed mask ventilation. But there were it was some? full of cases of difficult or failed intubation. And even four, you So NAP4, yes. No, that's, that's just, you need to get your naps right. I see, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you may not have had yeah. much to do with them, mate, but you've yeah. got to get the numbers right. And also, okay, I, I, I can show you, anybody can show you papers to prove or disprove any particular point of view that you you're want. You're getting very close to saying we don't need experts and we should ignore all the evidence. But, um, keep going. Uh, well, we can do without some experts, Cook, but there you go. Uh, the, the, the two great advantages of video laryngoscopy that it gives you a good view of the larynx without a direct alignment. But there are also the downsides of video laryngoscopy. You get such a good view of the larynx that you're convinced you can get that tube in, and you will keep going until you get that tube because you can see the larynx. And I can show you papers that says it takes longer to intubate, a greater instance of hypoxia, which then leads to a greater instance of death for people, people with head injuries. The, also, you don't get to see the bits in the corner. You're going round the corner as you're not aligned. You don't get to see the pharynx or the hypopharynx clearly. And all your tube manipulation is in the dark bit that you're not seeing. Right, and I will show you papers during the debate to show that there's a significantly increased instance of pharyngeal damage with video laryngoscopes. I'm not saying they're terrible. I'm saying that we mustn't say they're wonderful and must be universally adopted. We need to take things at a sensible pace. True. I mean, it's a good point that laryngoscopy and intubation are two separate things. You can have a great view, but... Yeah, I think there's, there's lots of misinformation, much of which um, Will is adding to, around video laryngoscopy. Um, and uh, poor training. So if, you can't, if, you don't, if you're not trained to use the kit, I come back to this point, if you're not trained to use the device you, you're using, mm. you won't get any benefit from it. Yeah. Um, and perhaps an analogy might be if you're trained on an automatic car and you get into a gear shift, um, you're going to struggle. And video laryngoscopy... And different video laryngoscopes require different techniques, so you do still need to be trained to use them. Um, and the vast majority of, of, of circumstances where people are struggling to, in, uh, where to get, get a good view, this, this, this idea that you get a good view but you can't intubate, we just really don't see in Bath because people are trained and they get the technique right. And I think if you don't adjust your technique and get the technique right, you will run into that pitfall. But that's a failure of training. It's not a failure of the so, device. So do you advocate that we'll need a standardization uh, across the board? Everyone uses the same video laryngoscope. Well, it'd be lovely if everybody did what I thought was right, but I think that's not going to happen. And I'm sure <laughs> Will feels the same um, on many levels. Um, uh, there will be competitors, but I think we need more evidence about what works well. I think there are, there are some um, inadequate um, devices in the market uh, and there are some uh, very good devices. There are also some very expensive devices and the cost needs to come down, which I think it will, um, and I think that will make it more available. But the, the, coming back to Will's point about um, poor airway management in general, I'm a huge advocate of um, universal airway training and uh, both in terms of routine um, uh, uh, procedures and also in, in terms of advanced procedures, which in, involves um, the apprenticeship in theatre, but also uh, structured learning outside theatres. And I think we could go a lot further in terms of improving that, and that would, I think, address some of Will's concerns. And I'll we'll close in a second, but can we draw any analogies with our journey from the uh, placement of central lines without the use of ultrasound, which... When that came along, uh, I, was, I thought it was abhorrent. I thought we're going to be completely de-skilled. The world would be a much worse place. Whereas looking back, I can remember people being seriously hurt by blind placement. I don't seem to see those just anecdotal reports of those terrible things happening anymore. 
Well, I don't I, know, is it? Just to, to show my consistency in this, when I saw ultrasound first being recommended by NICE in 2002, I mean, it was a mm-hmm. long time mm-hmm. ago, mm-hmm. Um, I was completely and utterly in support of it, and I was completely okay. convinced by the logic of it, and I could see that it would, over time, take away the need for the landmark skills. Yes. But I was wrong, because in my trauma unit, we still have to use the landmark skills every so often, and I rue some of the loss of those skills. What I'm saying is that video laryngoscopy is going to be a really important part of our armamentarium. It may often be routinely used. Do not cast aside traditional skills yet until we know exactly what the score well, is. Why do you have to use the landmark technique? Uh, speed. Speed. And the lack of the ultrasound being used on the patient next door for their fast scan. Okay, so, that, but, so that's, that's processes and management of the system. If the lines are available, the ultrasound should be available. So I, I kind of get that, Will, but that's like kind of saying we don't have enough ultrasound machines. So, so I'm with, I, I, want it, I want to believe that we should keep all this because that, that was part of what made us, you know, yeah. cardiothoracic and just line them up a few minutes, blah, blah, blah. Atul Gawandi says that the main, the main improvements in safety and healthcare will occur through doing things better, not to improve technology. Um, I, I believe that we need both. So anesthesia has become probably 100-fold safer in the last 30 years. Um, and I think some of it is down to doing things better. A lot of it is down to adopting these machines that go ping and with their red lights on. And I think we need to embrace both. Um, I don't think adopting new technology means that you have to ignore old skills or lose them. Um, I don't think that the hero anaesthetist um, or the hero intubator, um, which I sometimes um, hear about, is, is the way that patients want to be treated. I think we need to do what is easiest, safest, and best. Okay. So, Jov, I know you're, you're going to close this in a second, but what do you th- uh, you don't, when you're doing this bit, you don't normally answer the questions, but what, what do you think? You're, you're, you're the youngster here. Sorry. To um, uh, uh, my, my biggest concern is one I've already voiced, that, you know, that there's, with... With direct laryngoscopy, I know I can go to any hospital across the, the, the country and I can use it to intubate someone. And that's not the case with video laryngoscopy. That doesn't necessarily, that, you know, that is a, a, a system issue that can be resolved. Um, but I probably err on the side that uh, with Will that there is a place for video laryngoscopy, but whether it should replace direct, I'm still sitting slightly on the fence with to experts across the And there is a place for you in our department. No, thank you very much. Well. We'll talk like after, thank yeah. you very much indeed for what you've said. And fences are available throughout. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and we'd be happy to train you in bars. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, we have to move to the next session. But thank you very much to my guests for joining us. Uh, it's goodbye for me and all my guests. And we will speak to you later. Thank you. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favourite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, and get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue. We're categorising at the moment. We're having a little look through it. It may not always be in the form that you currently find it. So if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website perhaps or perhaps through your podcatcher. Oh, and if you fancy meeting us, why not go to the website ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.